I love that bumper. It's the best representation of terrible music videos about love from the 80s and 90s. And after going to two 80s parties in the last two weeks, it makes me want to break out into the foreigner classic, I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. Come on, guys. I know the Cougars lost and the Astros lost, but that's funny. (laughs) Well, we're continuing our Love Song Sermon Series this morning about relationships. Last week, in the context of Proverbs 18 and 27, we dove into what friendship means, how it looks in our modern society, and what it means to be a true friend. And for those that attended the 11 a.m. service last week, Andy jokingly challenged us to come as we are. So this morning, I felt that I would rise to his challenge, hence my relaxed appearance. And by the way, a relaxed appearance is kind of necessary for today's sermon topic. This morning, we're gonna talk about delight desire, and romance. We're going to dig into the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. Now, the Song of Solomon is part of God's Word, but it can be a little uncomfortable because it explores the complexities and ecstasies of human romance, desire, dating, marriage, and sex. I don't know about you, but I'm a little uncomfortable talking about this in church. And when I was asked to preach on the Song of Solomon, my first response was, really? Really? I can't do that. But as I intentionally studied God's Word, I learned that the Song of Songs is a necessary collection of poetry that explores our desires and necessity for romance. Navigating romance, desire, and delight in our relationships or marriages can be confusing. It can be overwhelming, and it's not talked about enough in church. Despite all of this, God created us with the capacity for these experiences, and we are meant to experience them. Before we start talking about the romance that we see between the beloved groom and bride, let's look at the context of this collection of poems or book of songs. The Song of Solomon is a love story that was written around 965 BC, about a thousand years before Christ was born. And we can study this book from two different perspectives. The first, we can see it as an allegory, a picture of God's eternal love for Israel or Christ's meaningful love for the church. Or we can see it as a love story between a man and a woman. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to watch as this couple passionately pursues, honors, cherishes, and values one another. Since we're going to talk about marriage next week, today we're going to view delight, desire, and romance in the context of attraction. Now, when I think about attraction, I think about Allison, my wife. 20 years ago, I was attracted to Allison as she bounced down the steps of my fraternity house at the University of Houston. As a matter of fact, when I saw her smile, her beauty, her flowing blonde hair, her big blue eyes, and the graceful way she carried herself and interacted with people, my heart fluttered. And I was so attracted to her that it was as if I had fallen in love. So much so, I stopped mid-conversation and asked, who is that? Unfortunately, 
Since I was a pledge at the time, the answer put me back on my heels. The person I asked said, oh, that's one of the active's girlfriend. Not wanting that kind of trouble, I backed off and struck up a friendship with her. Four years later, after Allison had broken up with my now fraternity brother, while sitting on the back of a tailgate, I mustered the courage to tell her that I had a crush on her since our freshman year. Allison paused, and with a smile and flushed cheeks, much like she probably has now, she said, that's nice. <laughs> Time marched on, and we reconnected seven years later. If you're not married, what are the qualities you want to be attracted to in another person? Are they physical or are they something more? If you're married, how can you build upon these qualities that originally attracted you to your spouse in order to strengthen your marriage? The qualities of attraction our desires and subsequently romance follow the acronym PIES. Now guys, I like PI, so it's easy to remember. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And if our relationships are only based on one of these qualities, like physical or emotional, we will start to look for the other qualities in someone else we will experience conflict, and our relationships may fall apart. As such, in order to joyfully delight in the type of intimacy that God wants for each of us, our relationships must be based on all four qualities. Intertwined within these qualities is godly character. I saw this type of character in Allison when I noticed how graceful and kind she was as she interacted with other people. And the bride in the Song of Solomon was attracted to the groom's character when she says, your name is like perfume poured out. What does perfume poured out really mean? Well, this perfume would have been very rare, an expensive purified oil. What's even more rare during this time was baths. And so this purified oil was very valuable because number one, it was costly, but number two, it would help you be more presentable when you went out in public. So the bride said, your name is like this. It's like this rare, expensive, purified oil that makes you presentable in public. In other words, you have godly character. Now, character and reputation are two different things, right? Reputation is who you think you are. But character is who you really are. So the bride says, hey, it's no wonder that other women love you. Notice, ladies, it's not because he was a hottie with a body. It was because his name was good and his character was solid. He was known as someone who loved God, who was seeking after God, and godly character should attract and fuel our emotional desires. As our emotional desires are fueled by attraction to our partner's character and beauty, we are drawn to their minds, their hearts, and who they are. And it is here when we grow to trust them. When Allison and I reconnected, it was under the unique circumstances of a funeral and a wake. But when we did, we talked for hours as if seven years had not passed. Naturally, I asked her to dinner as friends, and to my surprise, this time she accepted. When at dinner, 
Given our historical friendship, we naturally opened up and trusted each other enough to share some of the insecurities about our then life circumstances. Picking up on this, Allison asked, is this a date? It feels like a date. I smiled and said, well, it's only a date if you want it to be. She smiled and we continued our conversation for hours through dessert until the restaurant closed. And as we were leaving, we romantically kissed and agreed to see each other again. When you become attracted to someone, start dating and spend time with them, at some point you're gonna wanna open up and see are we growing in trust. And one of the ways that we open up is to talk about our physical and emotional insecurities. When someone reveals their emotional or physical insecurities and they feel worse afterwards, that's not a good sign. But if they feel that the person is loving them through it, then they're moving in the right direction. Unfortunately, after our remarkable and romantic first date, as a dumb guy, I did not move my relationship with Allison forward in the right direction. I didn't call her after our date. Yes, ladies, I did that. Guys, listen. After a great date, you have to call her. Don't text her, don't think she's gonna call you, make the first move and call her. And Allison, she made me work to rebuild that trust. She texted me with, I had a great time, but don't worry about it. We can remain friends. When I received her text, I was literally on safari in Africa closing a deal. So I made a call and told her that I was sorry, but I was called to Africa to get a deal done. Her response, I don't care. <laughs> Surprised by her response, I made another call and ordered her flowers. When she received the flowers at her office, she texted, thank you, but one of your best friends is a florist. Sometimes it's not a good idea to start a relationship with a woman that knows you and your friends so well. <laughs> Although it wasn't taken well at the time, Allison's statement demonstrated her high standards. Like the bride and groom in the Song of Solomon, we should desire and delight in high standards. We should look for them and we should be attracted to them. We should cherish them because when they exist in our relationships, we can honor and glorify God together. And when we honor and glorify God together, we are building a foundation upon which our marriages and relationships will stand. Like the groom in this morning's text, I was attracted to Allison's standards. So I responded by apologizing and asking for forgiveness. Several days later, after me making me wait a little while, I received a text that stated, when do you get home? What is your flight number? I will pick you up and we can talk. Encouraged by this response, my desire for Allison deepened. Starting with her giving me a second chance Allison has not stopped encouraging me. She encouraged me to go deeper in my walk with Christ. She encouraged me to join this church. She encouraged me to bounce back from a crippling and unexpected life turn. And she encouraged me to put my past behind me. And we have consistently encouraged each other to move past our reservations about marriage, to get married right here at this altar, to navigate life's ups and downs, and to keep the faith when we struggled for years in having William. I don't know about you, 
But we need this kind of consistent encouragement in our relationships. Through this type of encouragement, our attraction deepens and we are able to experience intimacy and oneness on a spiritual level. This is how the bride and groom encourage each other. This is the spiritual oneness that occurs in the Song of Songs. And this is what happens when we delight, desire, and love one another as romantically and deeply as they did. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual attraction and intimacy happen when we intentionally and actively cherish, value, and nurture those that we love. When we create that kind of intentionality and security by keeping Christ at the center of our relationships, we honor and glorify God. And when we honor and glorify God through our romance and desires, we will joyfully delight, grow in our love for one another, and our relationships will be more blessed than we can ever imagine. Through God's blessings, our relationships and marriages will stand as a testimony to his goodness, to his unconditional love, and to the complexities and the ecstasies of romance, desire, and intimacy that he created each of us to experience. Friends, please pray with me. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know no matter where you are or how you worship with us, you are always part of our church family. We would love to have you join us live downtown at 845 or 11 o'clock, or as always, through the broadcast. We would love to hear from you. If you have a question about today's service, if you would like to contact one of our pastors, if we can pray for you in any way, please reach out to us through our church website. Thanks for worshiping with us today. It was great to have you with us.